Podcast. Experience the thrill of a Packers game at Lambeau Field? If so, be sure to get your game tickets from the longtime trusted source in Wisconsin, Ticket King. Visit their locations in Milwaukee and Green Bay, or just go to their website at TicketKing.com. Again, that's the TicketKing.com. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this edition, which is a more somber version of Pulse of the Pack. It is Loser Tuesday, I don't really have a good title for it because losing sucks and I hate it, Uh, especially against the team that the Packers just played, which was the Minnesota Vikings, and we will get to that momentarily. I am your host, Jacob Westendorf. Uh, It's a normal Tuesday here in the middle of September. It's actually quite beautiful outside, so I'm enjoying some of the fall weather and such. Uh, Enjoy with me, as always, in the Twin Cities. Jason Perone. Jason, are you hanging in in Viking country? Yeah, it's pretty benign out here. I know that's bold for me to say. Maybe I just got lucky with my work environment. There's, there aren't very many people in the office who are, who are too brash. And even the one that was the most brash made some bomb-ass tortellini and brought it in, which completely redeemed her. So I can't complain. You know, it, it's funny being out here – first season as a resident in the Twin Cities, I have to say, a lot lot more chest pounding, but I think all those years of fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, have finally caught up with them, and I think everybody's kind of just chilling, baiting their breath right now, and just kind of riding it out, waiting to see what's going on. Jacob, I, um, I think I had a first on Sunday in my time as a Packers fan, and, you know, I'm, I'm not like the youngest guy on the planet, so to still be having firsts at this point is, is kind of cool. I've always wondered what kind of Packers loss would I actually be okay with? Because normally, and those of you on Twitter know, I don't handle that very well. I don't even hand, handle bad stretches of winning games well. So I'm sitting there watching this game on Sunday. I don't know if it's – because I know a lot of Vikings fans. I don't know if it was just because I had very tempered expectations. I know I flipped the script when I, we did our, our preview show. I predicted Minnesota would win this game. And then on Cheesehead TV, we did our predictions post. I had a win time, so I, I, I flipped the script. But I found myself oddly okay with the way that the game ended and the way that it turned out for some reason. So I guess – If there's anything good that I can say about it, it's that it was a loss, and that sucks, but I was kind of okay with how it went down, given the way that it went down. That's that's about the best way I can phrase it. Well, that makes one of us. I don't handle losing to the Vikings very well whenever. It doesn't really seem to matter. I've mentioned several times uh, this is my least favorite team on the planet. It's that purple team in Minnesota. I don't care much for them. Uh, especially all things considered, and we will get to all those things as to why I feel this loss was really unacceptable. Um, but, you know, that that all is for later discussion. Believe me, we got plenty of discussion coming tonight. So I do want to start with the small uh, news bit here, and if you want to call it small. But today, as we are speaking, it's Tuesday, and the Green Bay Packers have worked out C.J. Spiller. Uh, they brought him in for a free agent visit and a workout. Spiller, obviously, running back, spent some time in Buffalo, uh, most recently with the New Orleans Saints. Kind of a gadget back, uh, speed back, nice spread back, uh, catches passes, really an adept receiver. And the Packers have an open roster spot at the moment. They never filled the spot that Jarrell Presley voided last week, uh, which I thought was a little strange. Uh, And the Packers are down a defensive lineman, Latroy Guyon, two to three weeks with an MCL sprain, which leaves the Packers even thinner at defensive line than they were 
most recently. So they could use that spot for a defensive lineman. They could do some other things with the roster and add Spiller and a defensive lineman. It all remains to be seen what will happen here. But, uh, Jason, I want to know, first off, Spiller's got a name, uh, and it's a name that you recognize, which is uncommon when it comes to these types of workouts. So my first thought that I want to hear is, you know, what are you thinking when you hear the Packers are working out C.J. Spiller? Well, Jacob, I know that you introduced that question for our audience because you already know the answer. We actually were talking about this earlier today. You actually broke the news to me because I was at work and didn't know that that was going on. So I was encouraged to hear this because as soon as he got cut by New Orleans, my first thought was, well, you didn't go with Brandon Burks? Burks, correct. Yeah, Burks in, in the preseason. So they didn't go with Burks. They brought in Presley from Minnesota, who looked impressive on his measurables and from what we heard about him, but then we didn't see a peep from him in in the opening week at all. And then they make the roster move and they let him go. And so he's obviously a depth guy. And you've got a third back position open per se because the Packers have traditionally gone with three running backs and a fullback. And Spiller's got experience. He's a first-rounder. He is exactly the kind of back that I think a lot of Packers fans have been clamoring for. Uh, you know, kind of a, I guess I'll call him a third down back, but Spiller can give you more than that. I mean, he's, you know, he can come in, catch the ball in the backfield. He's versatile. And this accomplishes something that, Jacob, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on your positioning on this particular um, formation that the Packers run. I know you know how I feel about it. This is something that will get Randall Cobb out of the damn backfield because as much as he's a dynamic player with the ball in his hand and he can do special things, he has never done anything special out of the backfield. And the problem is, and we're going to break this down as we move along and talk about the Minnesota game and the Packers moving forward, when Randall Cobb is in the backfield, defenses know that he's probably going to get the ball. So every single time, but there's a high likelihood that he's going to get the ball. So when you've got 11 guys that know one guy is getting the football, that one guy is probably not going to break off a huge play. But you put Cobb back in the slot, you get your other wide receivers out there, and let's just assume that Jordy Nelson's going to slowly get his football legs back and improve as the season moves along, and Devontae Adams is going to figure out the drop seat. You know, Jared Cook gets more involved. You've got too many weapons now. You've got a spiller out there. They can't just key on him. It's, it's something to take the heat off of Aaron Rodgers. I think it would be a great move. So I'm, I'm hopeful, and you know, how I, you know how I feel if they don't pull the trigger on this. Um, something's going to get smashed up against the wall. But I also know that something is probably going to get smashed up against the wall because we're talking about Ted Thompson and we know how Ted rolls. That we do. We do know how Ted rolls. And typically it's unusual for him to sign somebody in the middle of the season. Uh, The last running back, I believe, that he signed from outside of the organization that had a name to him was Cedric Benson. Uh, And Cedric did some okay things when he was in Green Bay, but eventually – suffered an injury that ended up ruining the rest of his season. But, you know, Jason, you're right from the standpoint of this is a third down type of back, if you will. Now, you hate the Cobb in the backfield thing much more than I do, but this is also something where, you know, this guy is a running back. And, you know, most teams don't really respect the run when Randall Cobb is in the backfield because it it really is very rare that they give him the ball when he's back there. This is a running back that can actually – he's been a 1,000-yard rusher before. Now, I know that doesn't mean what it used to mean, and it's not as big of a deal, but it's still a 1,000-yard rusher, and the Packers aren't looking for him to carry the load, so to speak, so much as they are looking for someone to fill that role better than the way James Starks and or Randall Cobb has. So that's my thought on it. I think Spiller can help this offense if he is, in fact, brought in. Whether or not he is remains to be seen. Uh, And with our luck, we'll have him, the Packers will sign him during the middle of this show because that's what happened, uh, I think it was with Casey Hayward once upon a time in the offseason. So hopefully that is the case because I would like him to come play in Green Bay. But speaking of the offense, that's the story from Sunday night's game. Now, I know the Vikings have a very good defense, but the offense really did look like a lot of 2015's offense. Unable to get out of their own way. Aaron Rodgers is turning the ball over. I mean, their identity still seems to be drawing flags on the opposing defense. One of their touchdown drives 
was set up because Devontae Adams was interfered with on a potential touchdown pass. If Adam had, if Adams had caught that ball, it would have been an amazing catch. Uh, wasn't able to hang on, but did get the pass interference when the Packers were down. To the two-yard line of Minnesota, they ended up punching it in for a touchdown. And that was really all they did on offense for the rest of the night other than a, another schoolyard type play where Rodgers throws one up to Jordy Nelson. They get inside the two. Uh, they move back a little bit before Rodgers ends up running for a touchdown, and that's really the only offensive production they had on the night. So, Jason, before we get into the deeper issues, I mean, what were your thoughts on watching this offense as the game progressed? Uh, well, they didn't score enough points to win, so right there, we're not happy. Uh, let me just say this to get this out of the way right now. I was okay going for it on fourth down. The play call, I think McCarthy likes to outthink himself sometimes, and and he tried to do something the defense might not have been expecting, and that was his way of saying, hey, look, I'm innovative. So he runs James Starks instead of using other weapons that could have gotten some, some things going. Obviously, the glaring issue was the passing game in Aaron Rodgers. We, you know, we're two days later – and so there have been so many analyses and narratives and all sorts of things that have already been said, and we're probably going to repeat a lot of them at this point. But the footwork is just so sloppy, and I just don't watch the offense with confidence, I guess, is the best way I can sum it up in one phrase. It just I don't get confidence from the offense. I, I don't understand why Eddie Lacy's standing on the sidelines. It leads me to wonder, is he hurt? Is he not hurt? What's going on? McCarthy says he wants to run the ball. Okay, you got C.J. Spiller coming in for a visit, but you won't run your your star running back. It's you know, I mean, the far fetched theories that people put out there about oh, they don't want to overwork Lacey or they don't want him to have too big of a season. They don't want to have to pay him too much at the end of this year. Well, we'll talk about that another time. But it was pretty lethargic. But I think you know, it was lethargic based on what we've expected in the past from the Packers. I think, you know, we thought, okay, they, they put up some points in Jacksonville. Rodgers made that amazing throw to Adams. Jordy's back. You know, things are going to start to click. And that just wasn't happening. I mean, Rodgers was missing very badly. He's seeing ghosts in the pocket. That's very concerning. I and mean, his, his play right now is just, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. I try to watch up front, and I felt like the offense line for the most part did a pretty good job I mean they're coming they're going up against a pretty good front but I thought that the 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 front you know Lane Taylor once again not in the news which is good it just it's 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 not an offense that I trust to score points anymore and as far as Rodgers goes Jacob we've talked about it he just doesn't look like he's having any fun out there I mean his his facial expression when he's playing even when he scores I mean he just looks he looks nervous he looks concerned he looks kind of uh just short of defeated, even at the line of scrimmage. It's just, it's almost like, you know, he, it's almost like he's in there with, uh, with a team that he's never played with before, never practiced before. I mean, it is true when they said that Sam Bradford and Aaron Rodgers kind of switched places on Sunday night. You would have expected Bradford to have the kind of issues that Rodgers did, and it was, it was the complete opposite. It was just baffling. So the offense right now to score points, uh, it, it's not a given for for me, and that's that's a tough pill to swallow because. You know, I watched the 2014 season. I watched 2011 and the years in between and the MVPs. It's tough. I, I don't know. It's just tough to watch. A lot of things in there. Let me go back to the fourth down play um, because I am okay with him going for it there. I know a lot of people aren't. They say the offense is struggling. Take the points while you can. All that stuff, I understand it, but at the same time, those are the same people that last year or in years past complained about McCarthy being too conservative and doesn't go for it on enough fourth downs or doesn't go for two or, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm okay with it. I'm not okay with James Starks getting the carry. Uh, anybody that has listened to the show has understood that as of the end of last season, I was ready to move on from James Starks. I just think there's a point where, you know, running backs hit this wall and they are done. And I'm not saying James Starks is done because of a two-game stretch. But James Starks hasn't played very well to start this year, and he's not a short yardage running back. You have a bowling ball for that, and his name is Eddie Lacy. And let me give you guys some news here, and this is certainly a prediction on my part, but Eddie Lacy is not going to be the Packers running back next year. So they might as well use him up while they can. 
forget about fresh legs and let him go and let him run and pound him between the tackles and then say hello to a new running back next year when that time comes because I just don't think that this is a guy that you can trust long term and I don't think that this is a guy who's got a play style that really does well for long term. But at the same time, you know, Jason, you mentioned it. All off season, we talked about how or the Packers, Mike McCarthy talked about how, you know, the preseason was about being physical, running the ball, controlling time of possession, stuff like that. The Packers haven't done any of that in their first two games. There's no commitment to running the ball. There's no commitment to establishing Eddie Lacy. It all appears to be, so to speak, nonsense. And I'm cleaning that up a lot when I say that. And I'll say more later on. I don't want to ruin for later, but the Packers have had no commitment to running the ball, and now they're talking about how they want to run the ball more, and maybe that's why they brought T.J. Spiller in and yada, 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 but I don't – I'm sorry, I, I don't believe them. Until I see it, I don't believe them. Um, the other thing you mentioned, obviously, was Aaron Rodgers, and this is hard to talk about because it's just strange. He hasn't – you know, last week we were joking about can we remove him from discussion of ticket king of the game – and, you know, now this week we're talking about how you kind of go back through and you look at it, and Aaron Rodgers has been average for about a year or maybe longer. His last 300-yard passing game was in, against Detroit at home last year, and that took 61 pass attempts for him to get to 300 yards passing. And that was a bad game by him, too. I mean, I know that 300 is not exactly a benchmark, but in today's NFL, that's not a hard number necessarily to achieve. And it's been a long time since he's thrown for 300 yards. He looked really bad on Sunday night. That's one of the worst games I've ever seen him play. He's waving the ball around. He fumbled three times, I believe. He only lost, was fortunate to only lose the one. But more so than the ball security, the interception at the end obviously was a problem as well. But the other issues are, you know, there's throws that I know a lot of people are lamenting receivers aren't getting open, but some of them are. And he's either missing throws or not seeing them or not trusting them or whatever the case is. But, you know, Adam Check mentioned last week he wants to see Rodgers catch the ball out of the shotgun or take a drop from under center, drop back, and throw it to a receiver in rhythm. And he hasn't done that in a long time. Um I mean, what, what else is there to say? He looks like he's broken. I mean, he looks like a player that is either – he really does, he looks like a young quarterback that hasn't been coached up yet. And since you know that, he's not a young quarterback. It's almost as if he's not taking the coaching that he's being given. I say all that, Jason, to ask, what can we do to get our MVP quarterback back? Well, I think that I thought about this this afternoon and jobs that I've had that have been a little bit longer tenured in. And I can see how it might be easier to kind of look at your boss as um, a mentor, a friend, especially if you've had success together, you kind of feel like partners, even though ultimately one is responsible for the other's performance. And there has to be a, a hierarchy there and a level of respect that's given to that role from, you know, the, we'll, we'll say quarterback to head coach here. So if the theory, we, the Bill Walsh theory, 10 years after, you know, 10 years a coach has been in one place, it's time to move on, the message gets stale. If that's starting to happen, then the Packers have a real problem on their hands. And I also think that you've got a quarterback that's got a very, very big ego. I don't say that in a negative sense, but I think we can agree Aaron Rodgers has a big ego. I think he expects a lot out of himself. I think he has reached a certain plateau of success, and maybe he feels like he's entitled to a dip in his performance after all that he has brought to the table. But the expectations don't change from the fans. They shouldn't change from the team. And the message that we hear, at least in press conferences, is that they expect to be in the playoffs deep and winning championships. So if – You're right, Jacob. If Rodgers is not accepting coaching, then it's a big problem. I don't know what, you know, I mean, short of benching him, which is the worst possible scenario I can imagine, and that would be, you know, the the equivalent of insubordination in in the corporate world, 
he has to be willing to accept help. It's like when somebody has a problem, they have to be willing to accept feedback. They have to be willing to accept help. And I think, you know, if you, and if you ask him in a press conference, hey, are you, are you listening to your coaching? He'll tell you that he is. They're always going to tell you what, what you want to hear in the, the positive answer in, in the press conferences. But it has to start with Aaron Rodgers. He has to want to get better. It's fine if he's watching film, but who's he watching film with? What are they saying? Is he listening? The theories that have been thrown out around out there that maybe they need to dumb some things down a little bit, not because he's dumb, he being Rodgers, but just to create a situation where Rodgers can get into a rhythm because that's what he said in his post-game press conference after the game. We didn't get into our rhythm. So rhythm offense. Well, they're out of sync. They're out of rhythm. We hear that every week. So if that's the case, Holmgren used to do this. He'd script the first 15 plays of the game, and he would give Favre a couple of easy passes just to get the nerves rattled out. He'd still throw the first ball into the third row of the stand. But by the time the first drive was, you know, they were into the, you know, the, the middle part of the first drive, he was crisp because he had a couple completions under his belt. He felt good about what was going on. He felt good about his ball placement, where the receivers were going to be. All that stuff has to be there. You know, Zach Cruz said on Twitter this week, trust is a huge issue. Does Aaron Rodgers trust himself? Does he trust his teammates? Does he trust Mike McCarthy? Right now, I don't know. So then my question back to you, Jacob, not to hijack our script here, but my question back to you is, is that if trust is a key issue, what's the first step to getting that fixed? Well, Jason, you're married, right? Correct. Okay, so – to use analogy, head coach and quarterback is very similar to a married couple. Now, would you have married your wife if you did not trust her? Of course not. Okay. And would you still be married if you didn't trust her? No. Okay. So I say all that to say I don't know if there is something that can get that trust back. And I've been very – very upfront about how I feel about this issue. Um, I've said before that I do believe in Mike McCarthy. I do think he's a good coach. I think, in fact, that he is the best coach the Packers have ever had, not named Vince Lombardi, and that's putting him over a guy that you could argue should be in the Hall of Fame, which is Mike Holmgren. Um, What I say all that for is if that quarterback doesn't trust the head coach then you have to choose between the two of them well if there's anything I've learned watching football over my time is the head coach is a little easier to find than the franchise quarterback so that would mean the factors would have to choose between Mike McCarthy and Aaron Rodgers and in my opinion they should choose Aaron Rodgers which would mean the end of the tenure for Mike McCarthy which would suck for me uh, because, you know, as I've said, I I like Mike McCarthy. Any interaction I've had with him has been a positive one. I think he's a great coach. I think he's done some really good things in Green Bay. But if there's a rift between him and Rodgers, it's clear right now that that rift, assuming it exists, and that is the reason for some of this stuff, has been going for about a year and a half. By the end of the season, we're talking two full seasons where those two either haven't been on the same page or the offense has been poor or whatever, that means it's time for a new voice and you got to try something different. And that would mean you have to find a replacement for Mike McCarthy. And that's, you know, I'm not getting into that um, just yet because it's two games in and that would be ridiculous. But if the offense is bad all year, that is, that's the solution that I think you have to come to is it's time for, um, Coach McCarthy to go. And I don't want that because, you know, stuff I've said, but that really is what you have to get to. You'd have to choose one or the other, and you almost have to choose McCarthy. Any other thoughts, Jason, on this specific topic before I move forward to some of the other personnel groupings on the offense? Well, the only thing, because I don't think I really brought my example of the me and, a you know, my former boss, back to a full circle to, to making the point. And the point that I wanted to make there was that when the boss has to finally acknowledge that there's a lack of performance or there's a different direction that you need to go in to find success because it's not there like it was before, 
it's hard sometimes as the employee to accept that the numbers aren't there, the results aren't there, the, the things that you think that you're doing as well as you've always done them aren't because you just don't see it from an outside perspective. And so then it's, it's you know, it goes back to that whole thing where, you know, it's like, well, you know, I know I had to actually have that conversation with a, a boss of mine. And I felt almost kind of betrayed because it was like, hey, we've been through a ton of stuff together. I mean, you know, we, we've been through low periods, high periods, you know, and now all of a sudden you're cracking the hammer down. Like, what the heck is going on here? Like, have you forgotten who I am? And I think I took it more personally than I needed to, and it it, it actually created a, a a pretty big rift. And I ended ended up having to leave that job because because of it. And so, like you said, Jacob, that may be what it comes down to: is that one of the two have to go. And right now, Aaron Rodgers has too many too many years left in this league, hopefully, and he's got too much to still give to the game of football and hopefully to the Green Bay Packers that it's not going to be him. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much that. But, uh, you know, we can move on. I, I, at this point right now, I don't, you know, at this point right now, I don't have a whole lot of trust in Aaron Rodgers, and it is really difficult for me to, it, if number one, admit that, and number two, say it out loud. But that doesn't mean that that can't be changed. I agree. Uh, something I tweeted on Sunday night during the game, or maybe right after it was, it's pretty simple. Until I see it happen, I am no longer considering the Packers a good offense. Now, I know that that sounds crazy because, you know, you say, well, you know, they've got Aaron Rodgers, they've got Jordy Nelson, they've got Randall Cobb and Eddie Lacy and Jared Cook and all these weapons. Reality is this game isn't played on paper. And on paper, the Packers have a really good offense. But that ain't where the game's played. And until I see it, I ain't believing it. And, you know, that's kind of what I'm at with. I'm right with you there, Jason. I, it's hard to say. It's hard to admit because the Packers have had a good offense just about every year since I started watching them play. And they don't anymore. And that's hard to admit. One other thing that I've noticed through the first two weeks, all offseason we talked about all these wide receivers and how, how do you cut this guy? How do you cut that guy? How do you not keep this guy? Stuff like that. Packers ended up keeping seven receivers. Devontae Adams, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb have played 80%, more than 80% of the Packers snaps since the first two games of the season. Jason, i got to ask, what in the world is the point of keeping seven wide receivers if the Packers are only going to use three? I, I have no. I'm just as confused as you are. I don't. I don't know. I mean, this this is classic um, Ted Thompson, Mike McCarthy work here, and they dressed all seven, and we didn't see Jeff Janis at all, and Jared Aberderis. I'm sorry, I mean, he's not on the field enough. And and I have a question for you, Jacob. Before I kind of finish my thought, did did I miss a memo about Ty Montgomery not being able to catch a football all of a sudden? No, uh, that's one of the points I was going to get to at some point. Um, I I don't understand it, but, you know, that's kind of what we're getting at here. No, but there was no memo or anything that said Ty Montgomery couldn't catch football anymore. Yeah, I mean, he's he made the big play on special teams, and so it's like, okay, well, Ty Montgomery is, suppo- is supposed to be working his way back into the rotation and starting from the bottom insert the rest of the phrase for you Drake fans out there. Um, he has definitely earned his way back via special teams. He made, you know, he had the block punt. He's obviously not still hampered by the ankle, which is shocking to me. I think you and I thought that he was definitely headed for the physically unable to perform. List. Then all of a sudden he was activated in camp. And so there he is. And now he's playing, but you know, I mean, he started carving out a nice little role for himself last year got hurt in the San Diego game, and I know that it might take a while for him to get back, but he's not out there at receiver. Aberderis isn't enough, out there as often enough. I mean, these three guys, you're just going to trot the same three guys out there. I mean, one of the problems with offense, and I agree with it, is that it's not catching anybody off guard. It's very predictable. It's not innovative. 
You know, McCarthy's trying to do the old Vince Lombardi thing. Hey, the sweep is coming. Good luck stopping it. Well, everybody's stopping it. Everybody's stopping the Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, Devontae Adams express train. And Adams stops it himself with drops sometimes. And, you know, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say he had any of this last game. I actually okay this last game. But you're going to activate all seven of those guys. You know, Trevor Davis is finally back there at punt return, I think, as Micah Hyde got hurt. Even though he did come back in the game, I think they put Trevor Davis back there because they didn't want to expose Hyde any further. Okay, great. It was a fair catch. I mean, he had limited snaps at receiver. Jared Aberdare has caught everything in training camp. I just don't – I don't get it. You've got all these weapons. You've got all these different combinations of guys you can throw in there to give defenses a different look, to try to do some different things. Jacob, I mean – is it just the fact that the Packers don't have the right personnel? But, I mean, look at other teams. Every team seems to run some sort of a bunch formation, a stack formation. I mean, when was the last time we saw something from the Packers where they lined up and we said, wow? Uh, I mean, good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. And, you know, I don't know what what the purpose was of keeping seven wide receivers because – like you said, they dressed all seven of them, and three of them were on the field. I think it was Trevor Davis got six snaps, and Jared Aberderis got five. Or the other way around. One of those two, though. Ty Montgomery didn't receive a single snap. I just, you know, they keep saying you got to sacrifice one for the other. Is you're either playing tempo, in which case you're playing the same way with the same personnel groupings all the time, or you're playing multiple personnel groupings. Well, if that's the case, I think it's time to go to multiple personnel groupings because we've seen the tempo the last couple of years, and I think that's a nice change of pace in the middle of the game. You know, something's a little – it's similar to the Cobra package with Cobb in the backfield. It's a nice change of pace, but it can't be the identity of your whole damn offense. I don't think it can be that way anymore. I think it's time for multiple personnel groupings. I think it's time for more two tight end stuff. I think it's time for more three or four wide stuff. I think you can change stuff on a play-by-play basis, but – you kept all these freaking wide receivers and you're only bothering to use three of them. Now I know that you couldn't only keep three because obviously at some point, knock on wood, somebody's going to get hurt and you're going to need one of those guys. But, and I know that Janice has a club on his hand and probably can't play receiver, but there's still ways to use Aberderis and Montgomery and Davis. And if there's not, why'd you bother keeping them? That's really all I have on as far as the receiver position goes. It's just, there was no point in keeping that many receivers and releasing linebackers, defensive linemen, another running back, whatever you want to point out, defensive backs, edge rushers. You could have kept Lorenzo McRae if you wanted to go that route to throw out a name. I, there was just no point in cutting some of those guys if you're only going to use three wide receivers anyways. Jason, any final thoughts on this particular issue? No, the only thought I would say – that I would have is that this might be an area where the Packers may have to tinker with if they're going to make roster moves and change and you know because they worked out a linebacker today defensive line guy on doubt you know they may have to make a decision here if they have the extra guy and obviously to me it would seem like Janice would be kind of the kind of the the prime candidate because he's got the hand injury which is supposed to be healed up soon but they like every other guy they're going to put somebody else you know, all these other guys out there. So that's, that's it. I'm thinking, you know, maybe that's the card that they play when they try to shuffle the roster around. Other than that, my hands are in the air. Well, you and I both, then, and, you know, there's talk of the Packers have 52 men on the roster. Maybe Spiller's the guy who fills that 53rd slot. The Packers also will need another defensive lineman, more likely at least with Trey guy on missing at least one game, maybe more depending on how he heals over the bye week. If that were the case and they still wanted to keep all the receivers, you can easily release Joe Callahan and bring up a defensive lineman and stash Callahan on the practice squad if you so choose. But Lord knows with what the Packers have done and some of the stuff, I'm, there's still no reason for Joe Callahan to be on this roster. I, I won't let that go uh, because that's just how it is. Um, let's get to the defense real quick. Uh, the secondary, which was supposed to be the strength of this team, wasn't good. Demarius Randall got roasted. Morgan Burnett got beat on a touchdown to Kyle Rudolph. Uh, but, you know, I don't – the annoying part of this game is the fact that Sam Bradford had only been in 
Minnesota for two weeks. And they lost to Sam Bradford, and he really did light them up. Um, that's really the – him and Stefan Diggs lit them up. And that's with some of the other stuff that came along with There was some good. Kenny Clark played well. Mike Daniels was awesome. The pass rush as a whole. I think every outside linebacker either shared a sack or had one of their own. So that's encouraging. There's some encouraging signs from this defense. The Packers' rush defense is allowing less than two yards per carry. Adrian Peterson didn't get anything going the other night. I mean, there are some good things about this defense. Ultimately, though, this defense is one, at least in my opinion, that is more – it's set up to be good if the Packers' offense is still very good. And the Packers' offense is not very good, so the defense has struggled. But they have done some good things in their first two games. I think eventually the secondary figures it out. It's too talented not to, in my opinion, especially if and when they get Sam Shields back. Update on Shields today was he had a workout, uh, which is a progressive step in the concussion protocol, so he may or may not be ready to go this week. That all remains to be seen. But, Jason, what overall feeling did you get? Because they only allowed 17 points. But they're giving up a lot of passing yards to a guy that wasn't around. And let's be honest, Sam Bradford's not very good. I know that he played well on Sunday, and he's going to get a lot of praise for that, considering the circumstances and everything like that. Sam Bradford is not a good quarterback. That's been proven over and over again in the National Football League. He is average to above on his good days. But he lit the Packers up. So what's your overall feeling on the way this game went on the defensive side of things? Okay, well, settle in here because I have a couple thoughts, both on the game and on the defense in general. And with regards to Sam Bradford, Jacob, I think you're right. And that might be part of the reason why Vikings fans are kind of, you know, kind of just sitting back and waiting because they probably get the sense that they caught lightning in a bottle on Sunday night. And it happened to be at the perfect time. The now loss of Bridgewater, they are opening up their new stadium and they want a victory in the worst way. And Bradford comes out and puts up, you know, probably arguably his best game, if not one of his better games. I was listening to NFL radio, and I think he had 160 yards to Danny Amendola back in the days when they were with the Rams together. I mean, Stephon Diggs is a great receiver. What a steal for the Packers, and, or I mean for the Vikings. I wish he was on the Packers. He's, he's on the Vikings. What a steal for Minnesota. So that combination right there, you know, of course, it's kind of like when you're a new quarterback and you find that, you know, you throw to your tight end as your security blanket, and all of a sudden your tight end has a career night for 12 catches for 120 yards because it's a new quarterback, and that was the guy that he got locked onto. Well, Stephon Diggs was that guy for Sam Bradford. And Bradford threw some pretty good passes. He threw some pretty, pretty amazing balls and gave his receivers a chance to catch them. Uh, and they made the play. So, I mean, all those factors came together, but I think, you know, let's see how these next couple games go. They're at Carolina this week. Well, let's see how they handle that defense because as well as Bradford played, he was on the ground a lot. You know, the Packers defense got to him, and that was the encouraging thing to see was that the pass rush got there. I gave game ball to Julius Peppers, Mike Daniels. It was good to see those guys playing well, especially Peppers and his limited role. That's what they're going to need out of him. If he's going to have his snap count reduced, they're going to need more quality out of his play. And, you know, he may not have made any splash plays, but it was Kyler Fackrell that got in there on the tackle that, that uh, got Adrian Peterson hurt, which, you know, say what you will about Adrian Peterson as a person, and you know, but you, don't, you never want to cheer for an injury. So, Got Peterson knocked out. They had him in check. I, I'm convinced that had he played a whole game, I don't think he. I don't think he gets any much more than 50 yards. I mean, he could have easily broken one of his t- uh, traditional Peterson runs for 70 and made a fool out of me for saying that. But the way they were playing him, it looked like they were they were keyed on stopping Peterson and they wanted Bradford to beat him through the air. And unfortunately, it was the one one out of 10 times that Bradford can actually do that. You know, with regards to the secondary, it, it kind of brings up a point that I, I want to make, and that is that everybody keeps talking about how deep this Packers team is, how deep they are, how much depth they have. These you know, young players are ready to step in. I, I don't know if I want to hear that anymore because Sam Shields gets hurt. Now you've got Demarius Randall 
covering Stephon Diggs. You've got Quentin Rollins on the other outside spot. You've got Micah Hyde in the dime, or in the nickel, I should say, in the nickel. Morgan Burnett comes up and helps out. And then you've got Ladarius Gunter rotating in. Randall's just getting worked time and time and time again. And I know that some of the film studies showed that the Packers were playing a defense that I think was designed to kind of funnel receivers inward, and there wasn't anybody inward to pick up where Randall's responsibility left off. I don't know. Either way, it was not a good look for the secondary. I understand there's going to be a drop-off from your starter to your second, third guys, but at the corner, Randall, Rollins, and Gunter all have a long way to go before they bring something really reliable and solid to the defense on a consistent basis. I mean, last week, Randall was one of the better defensive backs, made some really nice plays this week, not so much. It's all about that consistency. And you lose a lot of speed when Shields isn't on the field. The Shields isn't on the field as well. So, you know, that's, that's my take on the secondary. I guess to take it a step further, too, if they're going to continue to do the safety blitz with HaHa Clinton Dix, they need to bring somebody in here to show them how it's done. I mean, maybe to get Leroy Butler to come in there and show them how it's done because he is not good at blitzing the quarterback. I mean, he looks like he's going half speed, trying to bull rush an offensive lineman. No newsflash, you're going to lose that matchup 10 out of 10 times. You know, it's, it's never going to work. I don't know why Capers keeps dialing that up. He's never gotten to the quarterback. I think he's got maybe one sack in his career was a gimme. I don't think he's ever really made it happen. I mean, he's best in coverage. Leave him in coverage. Put him back there and let him help with Stephon Diggs, who's, by the way, torching your corners and your secondary. So it doesn't pay, I don't think, to try to surprise the offense with the safety blitz from a good coverage safety when that safety is ineffective. You just pretty much took him out of the play. Now you've got 11 on 10, in my mind. But moving to the more positive side of things, you mentioned Kenny Clark. I think Kenny Clark showed that he can play in this league and he's going to grow into something pretty good if he can stay healthy. I don't know what he'll peak out at this season in his first year. I mean, guys are getting their feet wet trying to understand the the grind of the NFL life, team games, the schedule, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, he's a first-rounder, so he has to contribute. I thought he did a better job this week than he did last week, although I think he was in for more, you know, more reps and snaps, obviously, with the guy on injury. But, you know... The good news is the pass rush looked good in this game, and if nothing else, yeah, Sam Bradford had the game of his life. Okay, congratulations. But he's spending a little extra time in the tub this week. There's no doubt about it. Yes, he is, and, you know, that's the most encouraging part of this game, obviously, was that the pass rush was what it was, and it really was dynamic uh, for most of the game. Like you said, he's spending some extra time in the tub this week. Hopefully the Packers can continue that going forward. One other thing that's a bit concerning, you know, talking about the secondary specifically is, you know, in the past, a redeeming quality of Capers defense has been getting turnovers. And, you know, yeah, they give up some big plays, but they also make plenty of big plays. Packers have one takeaway so far this year. Uh, unless you count Randall Cobb taking the ball away on a fumble, and I think the Packers' first offensive possession but no takeaways yet, really, from the corners. No takeaways, actually, at all from the corners. The only interception you have is from Joe Thomas, and that was on a play where the ball was thrown behind the receiver and Rollins tipped it in the air enough to where Joe Thomas could go and get it. So a little bit of concern there, um, a little bit of concern in the secondary, but overall I think the defense as a whole, some of those things will get tightened up. When it comes to the two unit, two main units on the Packers team, offense and defense, Defense is actually on the lower list of my worries. Uh, I'm more, far more worried about the offense and, you know, what can they do to get back on track. So that all remains to be seen. The Vikings game is over, which leads me to the final segment of the Vikings portion of this show, and that is your guys' questions. Some of you have sent a couple, and we appreciate that, obviously. We answered a couple of them. Christina Jenkins, you got your own segment, so congratulations on that. Uh, why the Packers are keeping seven receivers if they're only going to use three? Great question. And as you can see, we built in a segment to this show uh, for that. Here's our other questions. We have two, uh, specifically three. Um, actually, I take that back. We have three. The first one from Jacob Padilla, and that is, how do the Packers fix this mess? Jacob, 
I wish I had a good answer for you because I really don't know. Uh, I can give you my best bet, though, and that is that, you know, you just kind of start to use Zach Cruz's words, treating Rodgers like a young quarterback. You know, you got to build him back up, help him trust what he's seeing, help him trust his teammates. Help him trust the offense because, you know, the other thing I did see, for as many people that talk about how the receivers aren't open, there are plays where receivers are open and Rodgers just isn't, either isn't seeing them or isn't hitting them with the ball. So that's the big part on the offensive side of things I think can fix the mess. And the other thing, and I'll kind of answer this later with another question, is you say you want to commit to your run game and do it. Stop saying it because saying it doesn't actually commit to it and do anything on the field because the defensive coordinator doesn't think on the other side of things of, oh, well, I know that they've thrown the ball quite a bit early on here, but McCarthy said in his press conference this week that they want to commit to running the football, so they're going to do that. So I'm going to play a run-oriented defense here. That's just not how it works. So, Jason, to answer Jacob's question, how do the Packers fix this mess? A guy with your, your namesake. And Jacob's actually a longtime follower of mine. So I guess since we've already covered a lot of it and we're going to kind of continue to break that down a little bit as we move ahead and look ahead, Packers just have to decide who they're going to be and what they're going to be. Do they want to be a team in disarray? Do they want to let their personal agenda overtake the goals of the team and the success of the team and or, or – stifle the success of the team because they're a distraction? Or do they want to get on the same page and figure out what it is that they want to be and what they want to accomplish? They tell us on the, on the topic of saying things and not doing them. They tell us all the time, well, we want to be a, a playoff team. We want to go to the Super Bowl. We don't hang division banners at Lambeau Field. Well, you know, if you want to do all that stuff and you want to be that, then you're going to have to get together and you're going to have to – work as a unit, work as a team. You're going to have to try to improve yourself. You're going to have to allow yourself to be improved. They basically have to find their identity in, in, in a nutshell. This team needs to find its identity, and I would say, you know, we, we keep saying, oh, it's only week two. That's fine, but, you know, let's not wait till halfway through the season to get this thing done. This, this team needs to start putting some quality wins on the board, and I don't care how the opponent in the division – look on paper, you got to, you got to win your divisional games and they got to, they got to win some of these tough road games and, and build that momentum. So when they get to the end of the season, hopefully as they're competing for division title and top and high playoff seedings, they've also got some mojo working in their favor. And that's, you know, that's my big picture answer to the whole thing. Figure out who you are. Ah, the old identity thing creeping back in. Lovely. Love talking about those things. Next question comes from Ricky at SlickRick858326. He wants to know, are these offensive miscues just early season sloppiness or something legitimate to be worried about? And, you know, again, I know we kind of discussed this, but to answer the question, I'd probably say a little bit of both. There's some things I think that are early season sloppiness, lack of game reps. I mentioned it during training camp. You know, they can talk all they want about how they they practice and they practice against their defense, and that helps them more than a meaningless preseason game. I understand all that. I'm just not buying it. You know, nothing really substitutes for live game reps. And you can see plays that Rodgers and Nelson, for example, typically make in their sleep that they aren't making because they don't have game reps. Now, it's also something to be worried about because it's been going on for a year. As I mentioned earlier, Aaron Rodgers doesn't have a 300-yard passing game since they played the Lions at home. That was in early November of last year. And that's not even a game that includes the Hail Mary. It took 61 pass attempts for them to get to 300 yards passing that day. So it's a little bit of both. Some early season stuff, but, I mean, it's also a concern because Packers haven't been a good offense in quite some time. Jason, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what what else to add. I mean, it's it's just like we said earlier. It's it's, it's frustrating to see, and 
you know, they're, they're going to have to, you know, people forget to, I mean, everyone likes to compare to the past and, you know, they've reached this plateau. Well, they did the same thing this year and they won the Super Bowl that year. So this is going to happen. That's going to happen. All they finished 10 and six, they were 10 and six in 2010. So, you know, this and that, and, you know, everybody wants to look at that yardage stat, but Jacob, you're one of the first ones I think that just you know, remember to look at how many passing attempts it took for all of that to go down. So, this is a this is a game that the Packers need to hone in on and and really kind of turn things around. I don't care what the quality of the opponent is. If Detroit's not what they were before, they're beaten and battered. You know that they they just they need to they need to get it going and they need they need to come in on the same page and and ready to go. Whatever the game plan is, I am really curious to see if. Uh, you know, I think McCarthy learned from the knee-jerk reaction he made after the Seattle playoff loss and he gave up the play calling. So I don't think we'll see anything quite to that magnitude. But there's a lot of noise out there. So I'm really curious to see if and what changes we might see when they take the field this Sunday. You know, I, I barked about formations earlier and different formations. I'm kind of hoping to see a little something different there and, you know, then the, the risk whispers and the rumblings are going to be like, oh, they were fine all along. They were just holding this back for, a, you know, their home opener or whatever. It's like, well, if they're doing that, why wouldn't they unleash it against Minnesota in Minnesota, one of the toughest games on their schedule? But, you know, that's that's just me. But that's that's how I see it. You know, this is, this is you know, time to, to turn things around. But I think they, they need an emphatic performance. So we, you know, we need to see some remnants of, of a couple of years ago pretty quickly here for everybody to kind of just simmer down and kind of calm down a little bit. And then the final question from Peter Schilke at 88 PJS. He wants to know why can't the Packers figure out an actual running back rotation? I suppose my answer to that question is they have. I just don't think it's very effective. It's pretty much like uh, Starks and Lacey trade series. And I mentioned earlier, I don't understand it because Eddie Lacey is your starter and he's one of those backs that seems to get better the more he touches the ball, yet you're fixated on James Starks who, let's be honest here, guys, James Starks isn't also a good start this season. He had seven carries for three yards on Sunday. I believe he had three carries for seven yards in the first game or something. He didn't have a very good game against the Jaguars either. His season numbers are not impressive to start this season. It's just they have um, they have a they have a thought process. I just don't necessarily agree with it. Uh, I think that you know the Packers need to use Eddie Lacy more. That's your starting running back. If you're going to commit to running the ball, commit to him running the ball because he was running the ball well on Sunday against the Vikings but the Packers didn't give him enough opportunities. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, all this riffraff you mentioned in the offseason about being physical and running the ball, well, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen a commitment to it yet. And, Coach McCarthy, if you're listening, and I'm sure you are, I don't believe you. So I'll finish that up here in a little bit. But that's my answer for you there, sir, is that – they have it figured out, but they just don't necessarily – it's not working, I guess is a great way to put it. Jason, what's, uh, what do you think here? This question about the running back situation is one of life's great mysteries to me. We've already kind of covered it. I just don't understand. To me, it, it's, it's why – how and why they're using, not using Eddie Lacy. I just, don't, I just don't get it. I mean, he's obviously a back that warms up as the game goes on. If you're going to get anything productive out of Eddie Lacy, he can't just carry the ball seven times. He's got to carry the ball between, you know, honestly, 15 and 20 a game. I mean, he's a big guy. You can, talk, you can make the jokes about how, whether he's in shape, not in shape. But, you know, he gets – you remember back to 2013 and 2014, those were the games when he closed it out, plowed through defenses, was running guys over. We all remember him running over Dante Hittner in the San Francisco wildcard playoff game in 2013. You know, I mean, that's late in the season after he's been through an entire year, but he's still trucking guys. I mean, you gotta, you gotta let him get his legs under him. And that's just not something that Mike McCarthy does. And 
with regards to what they're going to do at the position, well, we'll have to wait and see if he's, they're going to do anything with Spiller after the day. I haven't seen anything to indicate that they've signed him. So, you know, that it's probably not good as far as that goes if, he get, if he's on a plane and he's heading back to wherever he's been from. Typically, if they want a guy, they're going to sign him and keep him there. So, we'll wait and see. But I, I just the way that they're using Eddie Lacy is, is crazy to me. And my last thought on that is that, again, if they were trying to fool the Vikings' defense by running Starks on that fourth down, they fooled everybody because four carries for less than 10 yards in two games, he's probably the last person you expect to get the ball in that key situation. So kudos for the trickery, Mike McCarthy or Aaron Rodgers, if he checked to that play at the line of scrimmage, but no doubt. Well, and he should be the last guy you expect to get the ball because he hasn't done anything yet. This guy, I am. Uh, I just, I'm really frustrated with the usage of James Starks. It's a, it's an obsession with someone. You know, I know. Last year, there was discussion of favoritism and how James Starks doesn't get benched when he fumbles the ball, but if Eddie Sneed is wrong, he gets benched. Stuff like that. I just. I really struggle with having James Starks on the field as much as he is because I know he was dynamic in the screen game and he does make a couple of nice runs here or there. But like I mentioned, you know, all off season, I was ready to move on, find somebody else. There's a better back that can be the change of pace guy. And oddly enough, someone similar to that is a guy that worked out today and his name is CJ Spiller. So let's move on to the Lions. To quote Bill Belichick, we're on to Detroit. Jason, Packers, Lions, it's the home open. Oh, no, I take that back. I take that back. Ticket king of the game for the Vikings game. Jason, real quick so we can move forward. I know you mentioned a couple guys you gave game balls to. I'm asking you to only pick one. My ticket king of the game, Mike Daniels. Destroyed everyone on the Vikings offensive line and really set the tone for the Packers defense early against Adrian Peterson. They held Adrian Peterson in check. So, Mike Daniels, my guy. Jason, who's yours? Julius Peppers. Came in, spot duty, aging veteran, but we kept him around for a reason, and he he proved why he's on this roster and hopefully can continue to do that throughout the season. If he can throw down one sack every game that he's out there, he would probably surpass expectations, but love the way he played. That's exactly what he's there for. He got the job done. Yeah, it was nice to see Julius Peppers as well. He had a really good night, uh, as did the whole pass rush. But now, for real <laughs> – I promise for real this time, guys, we are on to Detroit. Jason, home opener, typically at home, the Packers' offense has been better than it has been on the road. What uh, what do you think the biggest key is here for the Packers' offense? And, you know, mine, you can kind of see what's been building up. Mine is very simple. Do what you say you're going to. Emphas- you, you emphasize things, you're going to commit to running the ball. Don't just say things that have no substance to them. If you say you're going to commit to running the ball, commit to running the ball. If you say you have seven wide receivers, use more than – well, you don't say that. You do. If you have more than seven wide receivers, use more than three of them. Change up the formations. Change up the route concepts. Change up the way that you're telling – coaching up Aaron Rodgers so he can see the field better, whatever the case is there. But the key to the offense is really making the plays that are in front of them because they're not doing that. There are plays that they are missing – and those plays they were missing, they used to be able to make up for because they had the big play. Well, they don't have the big play right now, so they need somebody else to make that, to make up for that. They need to hit those small plays so they eventually could potentially get a big one. But for now, they're not doing that. So if the Packers, it's, it's kind of complex, but I think it's simple. If they say that's what they're going to do, they want to commit to running the ball, commit to running the ball. Hit the plays in front of them. See if maybe you can take a couple shots, but this is a game where the Lions have a lot of guys that are banged up. They really, really should be able to win this game, uh, but they have to be able to score more than 14 points. So that's where it starts. Make the plays funny. Do what you say. Be what you say you are. Jason, biggest key for this game on offense. Well, I, I mean, maybe my my key is the same thing as yours. I'm just maybe wording it a little bit differently, or maybe they are different. It depends on how you you interpret it, but. The offense needs to – they need to dictate. They need to run their system. They've got to be proficient in – and this is going to fall on the coaching staff to, to kind of scheme it up against Detroit's defense. But run a play 
and execute it the way the play is drawn up. I get it that your receivers have to beat their guys, but and you know if Aaron Rodgers isn't as accurate as he was before, it's tough for him to make some of those throws. I think maybe we will probably, you know, this trend continues where he's not as accurate and he's not as good. We'll probably go back and watch some old tape of him a couple of years ago and look at some of the throws that he's making and just completely forget how incredibly razor sharp he's been in the past in getting his ball to his receivers tight spots. It's like, Oh, he doesn't throw interceptions. But I mean, one of the reasons he didn't throw interceptions was because he was so accurate and, and trusted his. Receivers. So they got to go out there and dictate the pace on offense. They got their, their plays need to work. It, you know, it can't break down all the time. And a lot of that is, is kind of falls on Rogers not to, Start scrambling around and running for his life because then you got receivers who have to a identify that the play has broken down and so whatever you were running is no longer, and b drift over to where your quarterback is now and try to outrun your man and catch a football while everybody is running at him trying to take his head off. That that just can't that just can't happen for sixty minutes on Sunday. So they're going to have to find a way to run their offense. I guess would be the simple and dumbed down way of of saying what I think the biggest key on Sunday. So there's that. Obviously, this game won't just be played on offense. And realistically, considering the rule I have right now, this game is going to be one on defense for the Packers because, like I said, until I see a good offense, I don't believe that they have one. So what's the biggest key on defense? Mine is with Jim Bob Cooter, and I promise I will say that name as much as I can in the next few minutes as we – break down this Lions game, but with Jim Bob Cooter running Jim Bob Cooter's Lions offense, uh, the Lions have attempted to use the running backs more in their passing game. That's one of Jim Bob Cooter's philosophies right there, is to get his running backs in space. He's got one named Theo Riddick, and he's pretty good. Uh, Amir Abdullah may not be around, but Theo Riddick's a good pass-catching running back. My point that I'm getting with is Jim Bob Cooter is going to try and get Jim Bob Cooter's running backs isolated on the inside linebackers, Blake Ryan, Blake Martinez, and Jake Ryan. Uh, this offense still has potential to be dangerous. Matt Stafford, strong arm, uh, makes some plays down the field. I know there's no Calvin Johnson, but this is still a good offense. They really do have to pressure him and force him into some mistakes. If they can take away – those routes from the running backs and kind of limit the pass catching run after the catch ability of the Lions uh, running backs, then I think you can see them pressure Matt Stafford and force him into some mistakes and get some takeaways down the field, which would be a nice, a welcome addition to this Packers defense from this year because they just haven't gotten a lot of them. So I, I say all that to say, you know, take away, take away the running backs and then if you can, uh, you know, get, if they do that, get some pressure on the quarterback and force some turnovers. So that is the key to stopping Jim Bob Cooter's offense. And Jim Bob Cooter, thank you for existing in the NFL because that is fantastic. But, Jason, I move this on to you now before my immaturity takes over the entire show. What uh, What is your thought here? What's the biggest key to the Packers defense? Maybe the biggest key is to take out Jim Bob Cooter on the sideline, like he is he, I don't know if he's in the box or if he's on the sideline, but can you, I mean, can you, can you mash the cooter? I'm not sure if he's in the box or on the field. I'll have to look uh, because I think I'm going to be in attendance on Sunday. All right. Well, mash the cooter or plow the cooter. And that's all you're getting out of me on that topic. So, Interestingly enough, week one, the Packers were prepared for Chris Ivory at running back, and it turned out that he was unable to play, was inactive, and so they got T.J. Yeldon instead, who was more of a slippery, scat type of back. With Amir Abdullah possibly not available this week, the Pack, or the Lions brought Joy Bell in for a workout today. And if they do end up signing Bell and he ends up playing any significant snaps, it's going to be the opposite effect where they will have prepared for a slippery scat board type of back and they're going to end up getting a big power guy. And Joy Bell has actually had some decent games against the Packers in the past. I don't know how well he would come in and acclimate right away, even though he's been with this team for, for years. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. 
but it to me it's it's going to be pre- getting pressure on on Matt Stafford. Matthew Stafford has actually not played awful this season. He hasn't been terrible. So, you know, it's the Lions. You know, they don't look to be as solid as they've been in years past, and they don't have Calvin Johnson. And Eric Ebron, you know, who knows? I mean, when he decides to show up and play, he's a weapon and a half and a great talent, but sometimes he's either absent or he's dropping footballs. I think it's just I think it's gonna be getting pressure on Stafford. Last week it was stop Adrian Peterson, stop the run. You know, the run defense looks like it can do a pretty decent job on its own. I think they, they work on trying to get to Stafford. I don't want to see ha ha Clinton Dix trying to blitz the quarterback. But you get that pressure on Stafford, you get him kind of moving around he's a little more mobile so you got to be careful because he can run a little bit but that'll that'll get the lines off their game and then i think the packers force a couple turnovers and that's something that i think can really team and then you get a score that's a little bit more indicative of what we're used to where the packers get into the 30s and their opponent lands in in the low 20s you know that's kind of ideally been the formula so that's me we want to see matt stafford on his back on sunday as often as we can so you have that, which leads us to one final thing. That's the game prediction, and I will go to mine. As I said, until I see it, I don't believe the Packers have a good offense, but I think they can win this game on defense. The Tennessee Titans just shut down this Lions offense. I think that the Packers can do some things. They've forced Stafford into some mistakes before. I think they can do that and get just enough on offense. To eke out a win at Lambeau Field in the home opener for the fans. So I've got Green Bay 21, Detroit Lions 17, uh, with a big win coming on the defensive side of the ball. Jason, what do you think here, Packers or Lions? Packers, and I'm going to give a little love to the place kicker, Mason Crosby. He's going to tack on a field goal on top of your prediction. So I got 24-17 Packers somehow, some way. Late in the fourth quarter, there will be some situation where Detroit could possibly tie it up. But I think the defense is going to come through, whether it's a big sack or a turnover. Packers get the win in their home opener. I have a hard time seeing them dropping this one, especially two years in a row after beating Detroit umpteen years in a row at Lambeau Field. Right the ship. It's not the blowout that we're all hoping for. It doesn't matter. Get back in the win column. Take the week off. Come back fresh and ready to go. And then I think they've got the Bears coming off the bye, don't they? I believe it's the Giants and then the Cowboys and then the Bears. Yeah, that's what I meant. The Cowboys and the Giants and Bears, Jacob. Thank you. Right. Giants, Cowboys, and Bears. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about we the are. damn order? They're all they're, they're all at home. They're all at home. Packers yeah, are four straight home games. That's what we care about. So um we are so Jason and I both the like the Packers. And it feels good. Yeah. I can tell we've been here for too long, but that's going to do it. Jason and I both like the Packers this Sunday to beat the Detroit Lions. Thank you for checking out today's show. Be sure to check out PackersTalk.com for all your latest Packers news and podcasts. You can follow the show on Twitter. We are at Packer Pulse. Thank you to everyone who sent us questions today. Uh, I believe we addressed you all directly. If we did not, please feel free to yell at me. I do accept criticism and coaching from our listeners. Uh, you can follow me personally. I'm at Jacob Westendorf. You can follow Jason at Jason Perone. I want to thank our sponsors at Ticket King. Uh, it's right down the street from the state. Guys, I am picking up my ticket for Sunday's game from Ticket King. So it's good enough for me. I think it's good enough for you guys. Grab your ticket, walk to the stadium, it's a short walk, go in, cheer on the Packers. Help me out this weekend with your voice. Let's go beat the Detroit Lions. Behind our help from the crowd, force them into some mistakes, all that kind of good stuff. Thank you, guys. As always, uh, tough loss on Sunday. Packers need to regroup one and one going into a showdown, NFC North showdown against the Detroit Lions just before the bye. Thank you guys for listening to Pulse of the Pack. of the PAX Podcast. 
Do you want to experience the thrill of a Packers game at Lambeau Field? If so, be sure to get your game tickets from the longtime trusted source in Wisconsin, Ticket King. Visit their locations in Milwaukee and Green Bay, or just go to their website, theticketking.com. Again, that's theticketking.com.